Now, I'm not going to have a particular developmental focus today. I'm going to have a rather general perspective on issues of health in relation to urban densification. And health as it is mediated by psychological restoration and contact with nature for urban residents. Now, the basic point that I want to communicate is that as we densify, we reduce the opportunities for contact with nature and thereby reduce opportunities that nature provides for psychological restoration. And we'll see that this is important in a variety of ways. I don't think I need to say so much about why densification is going on. My guess is that most people, whether you work for the Stockholm Resilience Center or simply live in Stockholm, you're familiar with discussions around densification, around fratetning. And you've heard the arguments why we densify. So here you have an image. I've taken it from an airplane window. I'm flying into Orange County, California, a community that developed largely since the 1950s, or I should say a set of communities. Actually, it's a dozen, 20 different cities that have grown together, and they have in, in turn grown together with Los Angeles. You have this enormous urban agglomeration that's very low to the ground. It spreads out and it's predicated on automobile transportation. And people have argued for a very long time now that we cannot continue to develop in this way. We cannot continue to build out human settlements in this way. We need to bring people close to urban centers that we can service with mass transportation. Services are closer by. People can walk to stores, walk to services, walk to schools and workplaces. We need to do more of this, is the argument. In doing that, in building closer together and building up, perhaps, will reduce demand for energy due to travel and heating and so forth. And perhaps we can save people time as well. We don't have to spend so much time in a car commuting, for example. Well, here you have Seattle. It's a downtown building up. But much of this building up is for financial services and businesses. It's not housing. It's not really where people live. But we do see that in places like New York, Stockholm, elsewhere, there's a move with densification to build up. And so we see one kind of conflict arise. That one person's new home is in somebody else's former view. The people who could look out and see the water from their apartment now look out and see a building. And this is something that people tend to have opinions about. Often not very pleasant ones. Oh, it's so nice to look out the window and see all the neighbors there. So densification involves changes in the lives, in the life circumstances of people who are already in place. They may lose amenities that they appreciated before, a sense of openness, style of architecture, the views, and quite possibly green spaces. Uh, this is not just an issue for very large cities, world cities. You see this happening in many different places. Uh, here you have new housing in Uppsala, not far from where I live. Am I standing in the view for some of you? No. Nope. Because I have to tell you, I've been given instructions. I shouldn't go beyond this line <laughs> because of this camera. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, camera. That's fun. But let me know. <laughs> so here we have new housing in Uppsala, and it really is housing. And this is another part of this densification discussion. People experience that densification really is about putting more housing into spaces, not building cities. 
So here we have a conflict issue as well. How do we develop? Not just putting housing in, but extending the urban life, extending the urban fabric, housing along with services and possibilities to work and so forth, and amenities, perhaps amenities including well-designed small green spaces. Even this, though, is relatively low level of densification, is causing conflict, causing concern. Uh, I pulled this from Uppsala Niyati Nian. Right, I read in Uantea that Rix Hem has put forward a proposal to build more student housing in Uppsala. Great. Unfortunately, these would be placed between the existing apartment buildings on Kantorsgatan, where there now are beautiful green spaces. Terrible. I think you've probably seen letters like this, Dagens Nyheter, Svenska Dagbladet, or other local newspapers. It's nothing particularly unique. Boy. <coughs> the area is used frequently. We students need more than only our own home to get through our period of study in Uppsala. We must have access to nature in proximity to our homes. Is the only solution to our housing problem really that we should reduce our standard of living in already crowded areas. Well, here you have a student writing into the newspaper. It could be a parent of small children. It could be an elderly person. It could be a person representing any number of different groups who are concerned about the implications of densification for access to green spaces, which it seems people particularly value. The student says, we students need something more, we must have access to nature. What is behind that? Well, let's expand this statement of the problem. Is the only solution to our housing, or we could say transport, or energy, or pollution, or nature protection, or other problem, really that we should reduce our standard of living in already crowded areas? So it seems there's some necessary connection being made between densification and decline in standard of living. So we have in front of us this challenge and it's extensively debated. How can societies ensure that urban residents have access to health promoting green spaces and other amenities while also pursuing the benefits of densification? So this is a question I think many if not all of us have well understood. Well one of the things that I want to address here is this claim being made that they need this proximity to nature, that they must have this in order to get through their studies. This is somehow vitally important. And much of the research that I have been doing at the Institute for Housing and Urban Research in Uppsala and before that at the University of California at Berkeley and at Irvine has to do with the potential health resource values of contact with nature or nature experience. And I have to emphasize, nature experience is heavily subjective. It's not an experience that demands large areas of untouched wild nature. A person might look out the window here, if the window or the curtains were open, and look out at the garden and look at a bird in a tree and for a moment be transported, reflect on being in a forest, run away in his or her imagination. We could say this is an experience of nature despite the fact that the person is situated in a room looking out a window. So experiences of nature can be widely available even in dense urban areas. There's a lot of interest now in the experience of nature and what it can mean for individual and population health. Uh, last year, in the annual review of public health, together with colleagues from Glasgow and Wageningen and Seattle, 
I published a review invited by the Annual Review of Public Health on nature and health. The first time that they invited a review on this particular topic, understanding that we would be speaking to the subjective aspects of contact with nature. And in this review, my colleagues and I looked at the literature and understood that we could organize a very large amount of now well-structured experimental and epidemiological literature having to do with different, we can call them pathways, between nature and health. Uh, it occurs to me that you may be unable to see much of what is given in this image. Let me walk you through it then. Here we have the natural environment. Here we have contact with nature as such, people's experience of nature. We assume then that it is connected with the availability of features of the natural environment. But here we emphasize that there's this subjective component. Then we have these different boxes that represent different pathways. So you can see that contact with nature as such leads through different pathways to health and well-being. Now at the top you have a pathway, air quality. You can see that natural environment on its own has a direct influence on air quality and that that may influence health independently of the experience of nature. But we can appreciate that contact with nature may also lead into an experience of air quality. People going out into parks, green spaces, because they think here the air is fresher. Now we have other pathways, physical activity, social contacts, and stress. And each of these pathways is in the focus of substantial amounts of research, particularly physical activity and stress, to a lesser degree, social contacts. So we have the idea, for example, with physical activity. When you have green spaces close to an urban residence, it will attract a person or people out together to become more physically active, to walk or to run, and that physical activity over time will be beneficial for their health. For example, social context, proximity to parks and green space. If you have a park or green space nearby, the argument goes, people will be attracted out, they will meet their neighbors, they will socialize, they will build social context. It will help to reinforce the community. And over time, this will contribute to health and well-being. And then a stress pathway. And here too we have a direct relationship or direct line from the natural environment. The natural environment may shield people from stressful exposures. There's a discussion of whether vegetation in cities may shield people from sound, unwanted sound, or mask unwanted sound, or capture air pollutants or whatnot. But there's also this pathway that leads through contact with nature, that people come out to natural environments because they value that experience of relaxing, of leaving work demands, family demands, social stressors behind, coming out and finding something beautiful to engage with, something interesting that doesn't demand of them some active input. They can go out and let their mind, let their attention wander. And over time, this will be beneficial for health. So we have these pathways. We have accumulations of experimental and epidemiological research helping us appreciate that, in fact, these are plausible explanations for how urban parks, green space, can support individual and public health. It's important to point out, too, that 
we see these pathways as related. So you see between the little boxes, little arrows, it's to say that, for example, stress and physical activity or stress and social contacts may be related pathways. People go out to get an, a restorative experience, but they may go out with a neighbor. And they go out and they walk together. So we see that when people are going out to these places, multiple pathways may be engaged, working to establish the relationship with health. Now, an important aspect of this stress pathway is reducing exposure to stressful circumstances, but by far most studied is psychological restoration. Contact with nature promotes psychological restoration, which over time can promote better health and well-being. And we have different theories that we work with to guide experimental and other kinds of studies. Uh, attention restoration theory and a psychoevolutionary theory. And they deal with different circumstances from which people may come into parks. Or we could say different antecedent conditions that people may be having to deal with when they go into parks or green spaces. So directed attention fatigue is a concern of attention restoration theory that people in everyday lives in cities, work, family demands and whatnot, a lot of times have to really engage an effort to attend, make an effort to attend, and over time they lose the ability to maintain that effort, they become fatigued, they lose focus, and then they have difficulties in functioning effectively. at work, in the family circumstance, and so on. Psychoevolutionary theory, we actually could call stress recovery theory. It's dealing with acute physiological stress. So the person is running, running, running for the train. They've got just a minute left. Are they gonna make it? They're moving, they're moving. Gotta get on that train. They're on the train. Then a possibility for restoration occurs. Well. The argument with this theory is that, in fact, in urban life, many people could be coming to these parks and green spaces, having left behind some kind of stressful situation at work or family. So the research is informed by and guided by different theories about what people can restore from and how contact with nature can promote restoration. Now, I'm not going to go into these theories any more than that. Those of you who are interested, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. What I want to do is give you an example of the kind of experiment that has been done to test statements that we take from these theories. So this is a, a study I had done actually for my master's thesis at the University of California at Irvine. It came out in an article published in 1991. We had people drive out to a field laboratory either in downtown Santa Ana, California, in Orange County. Remember that aerial picture I showed you before? Santa Ana is in the area there. Drove out to a field laboratory in Santa Ana or they drove out to a field laboratory in Santiago Oaks Regional Park. Now reflect for just a second Do you notice a difference? <laughs> At this field laboratory, they went through a series of tasks for about an hour, quite demanding tasks. Tasks that required them to concentrate intensively and continuously. After doing the test, they went out for a walk. They walked for about 50 minutes and then they came back to the field laboratory. When they came back to the field laboratory, we gave them a text and said, so look through this text. We'd like you to find the errors in this text. We've put some errors in here, simple things like there's a period missing at the end of the sentence or the word the is misspelled. So a test that actually doesn't require any great intelligence. It just requires that you're paying attention. And what we were interested in was whether those who walked in the park were better able to detect the errors in this text. 
compared to those people who walked in the downtown area and those people who sat in the laboratory simply relaxing after having completed this attentionally fatiguing task. And what we found was that, in fact, those who had walked in the park had a somewhat better uh, percentage correct, that is, a detection of errors. So proofreading performance, percentage of errors detected, somewhat larger in that group that took 50 minutes after this demanding task to walk in the park. Well, this may seem rather unimpressive, actually. It's just a few percentage points. But the point we want to make is that think of all of these millions and billions of people living in urban areas engaged in mental work, where even a few errors that go undetected actually can be meaningful. So small effects in aggregate may be very important. This kind of experiment has informed other work. So here you have a study that was done in the Netherlands, a group that took self-reported health, a survey to about 250,000 Dutch adults, matched their self-reports about their own health to <coughs> geocodes for their address, which they could use to establish about how much green space they had around their residence in their postal code. Now here, the dependent variable is percentage of health less than good. The outcome is percentage of health less than good. And as we move across the diagram, we're moving from zero percentage of green space in the nearby area to 100%. And you can appreciate that there is a gradient here. As you have more green space, there's a smaller percentage reporting their health is less than good. And this is a study that takes into consideration the usual suspects in epidemiological research, age, and so forth. So we can go from the experiment to the epidemiological study and see that there is something important here. When a student writes into a newspaper in Uppsala and says, we need this, it's perhaps not just a personal view. We actually can look at these associations on the population level and appreciate that these associations may have particular weight for certain vulnerable groups. So here you have a study published in The Lancet, 2008, by Richard Mitchell and Frank Popham. They took the population of England, I think it was 40 million people or something, and they looked at how much green area there was in a particular ward. They organized the population into wards and then they assigned green space values to wards so that they could have groups with exposure to green space going from least exposure to green space for groups in this set of wards in England to most green space exposure. They further group these people in terms of income deprivation. We could say socioeconomic status or socioeconomic position. And they looked at how these variables related to deaths from circulatory disease over a five-year period. Now what we can appreciate is that as you're moving from least green space to most green space, it appears that generally incidence is declining. But what is more striking in this figure and what really uh, made this article so important was that the gradient in incidence of circulatory disease death, adjusting again for the usual epidemiological suspects, the gradient became weaker. So here you have at the bottom line here, the reference value, those people who economically are best, best off, relatively wealthy people. And you can see that as you get less and less wealthy, the incidence climbs. 
That's the gradient, the classic social epidemiological gradient in socioeconomic status and health. And you see that for each of these groups, but the gradient is weakest for those groups with the most green space. And these authors argue that for people who don't have economic resources, having that green space close by actually may buffer them from the harsh effects of poverty. So we have experimental research. We have epidemiological research speaking to mechanisms and to societally important outcomes that affirm this notion that having access to green spaces in urban areas is important. And we have a situation with urban densification that we're worried about. A lose-lose situation. With densification, we may increase environmental demands. More people in less space, more noise, experiences of crowding. And at the same time that we have an increase in environmental demands, we may have a decrease in opportunities for restoration as green spaces are lost to people. This lose-lose situation then is one in which we can assume people will not simply passively stand by. And we see that people fight to preserve parks. In Uppsala we had long, drawn out, and probably completely avoidable fight over Seminari Parkin. The municipality sold the park to a building company. They wanted to really put in a lot of housing there, and certainly there's a need for housing. But it was clear that this is a particular space that people valued as a park and used as a park. And they fought for it, and that park is going to be, to a large extent, preserved. There are other things that people will do to compensate in this densification situation. Um, this caught my eye just the other day. The balconies that stick in the eye of the neighbors Tula Tornan's exclusive balconies in brushed aluminum are blinding. Not least for the neighbors who are forced to wear sunglasses indoors. <laughs> to not be blinded. So we're putting lots of people in new housing close together and wearing sunglasses, I'm sorry, that's perhaps a little bit amusing, certainly not for these people who have to wear them. But I'm thinking of the more mundane kinds of things. People having to keep the, the curtains closed much of the time because they don't want their lives to be exposed to neighbors. People will change their behavior in a variety of ways to compensate for densification within their homes and outside of their homes. We can anticipate this. Compensation can take different forms. Uh, here I have uh, information from a study done by Seitzma et al., colleagues in the Netherlands again, uh, together with a map. These people studied the ratio between what they called gray days, days spent in a densely urban area, and green nights. Nights spent away out in the countryside, in hotels, for example. And here you have a map. It shows the grayness of the living environment in the Netherlands. So you have the red and dark red areas here. These are areas of shortage, shortages of recreation opportunities for walking in a green environment within a two and a half kilometer radius by neighborhood. So they take interest in whether people living in those red areas are spending more nights away from home and that's what they in fact find. For people living in the most gray urban areas, 20% of their holiday nights appear to be related 
to a shortage of green space. For people in the least gray areas, 10% relates to a shortage of green space. So almost a doubling of holiday nights away. Again, another example of compensation. In Sweden, I take particular interest in leisure homes as an outlet for compensation. I take an interest in leisure home ownership as a form of compensatory behavior for increasing urban densification. And if you go back, in fact, to some of the old inquiries, governmental inquiries, you could see that there were recommendations that areas be set aside, in fact, for small stug or cabins, leisure homes, for people living in Stockholm and other cities, anticipating that they would periodically want to get out of the city to a greener place and yet might not have a wealth of economic resources to travel far. Simple cabins that could be available to many different people. And in Sweden, in fact, we have quite large percentage of adults who own a leisure home, more than 10%. And then, of course, there are those people who have access to a leisure home through their husband or wife or partner, child, through the family circle. So people quite commonly here have access to a leisure home. Uh, research that I've been doing with colleagues at the Institute for Housing and Urban Research, uh, Department of Social and Economic Geography in Yatabori, here at the Royal Institute of Technology, have considered home ownership as a function of density. Density considered at different spatial scales. So do you live in a multifamily housing? Is your multifamily housing or your single family home in an area that would be classified by Lantmeteriet as dense urban structure? Is there a lot of that dense urban structure in a one kilometer zone around the, the home? Is that one kilometer zone in Stockholm compared to, say, Uppsala? So we can look at density that people face in everyday life on different spatial scales. And I'm sorry to say I can't present those results for you here. We're engaged with that work. But our preliminary analyses indicate that those different lay, uh, layers, if you will, or levels are all meaningful. All contribute to an increased likelihood of owning a leisure home. And particularly in Stockholm. So when you set living in multifamily housing in dense urban structure, in a buffer zone with a lot of dense urban structure within Stockholm, we're seeing that the likelihood of owning a leisure home is uh, on the order of five times greater than if you're not in these different levels of density. Well, you can ask a question at least, and I can answer this question now with data. Does compensation actually do something? So they have a leisure home. Does it actually mean anything for health? Well, this is uh, maybe something of an oldie but a goodie, published in 2009. Uh, but I think it doesn't get discussed enough and perhaps because it takes on a challenge with leisure home ownership as a means of coming into contact with nature. This is a study that we did using official register data for the period 1990 to 2000. We have a database with individual level data for all people registered with the social welfare system. Annual data so we can follow people over time. We can see, for example, have they maintained the same residence? Have they had income from paid employment? So on the basis of criteria like that, we selected out a population, more than 42,000 people who met certain criteria, stability in residence, stability in employment, people living in Stockholm or Göteborg or Malmö who were 
engaged in working life in a densely populated urban setting. And we could follow those people over time and then at the end of that period look to see how many of them retired early for health reasons. Fertides pension. Now we chose to do this with the period after 1997 because some of you may recall before 1997 Fertides pension, early retirement of this kind, sometimes was more of a labor market response or response to individuals having difficulty staying in the labor market than it was a matter of physical health. After 1997, requirements were tightened. So we have a measure that should reflect on people going to medical professionals and saying, I'm having difficulty completing my, my work and getting agreement from medical professionals on a permanently diminished ability to work and getting this early retirement benefit. This is one of the issues, of course, with working with register data. Uh, measurements are not uh, pure, they're not free of error. But here we have at least a meaningful, potentially important, outcome. 1,441 of these 42,000 plus people retired early for health reasons in these years after eight years of follow-up. Follow and we looked to see whether the early retirement was less likely to occur with those people who happened to own a leisure home. Compared to people who did not own a leisure home and who did not have access to a leisure home through anyone in the immediate family. Among men, leisure home owners had 42% lower odds of early retirement for health reasons than non-owners. So for men, it seemed the leisure homes did support health. This is a prospective association. It's still a correlational study, but we have followed people for for these eight years and then we see that after those eight years men are less likely to retire early if they own a leisure home. Among women ownership of a leisure home did not provide a similar benefit. Rather the most highly educated and highly paid women had 64 percent higher odds of early retirement if they also owned a leisure home. Um, this is perhaps unwelcome news for many people who have had wonderful experiences out in their leisure homes. Um, but when we first came out with this study, uh, it was a journalist from Sid Svenskan who got wind of this study and she contacted uh, Tina Rosenberry <coughs> from Feministiska Initiativet. And she jumped right on it and said, well, of course, the leisure home, for, for many women, it's just another domestic setting. It's just another place where they go out, they have to take care of cooking and cleaning, and in fact they're doing it under relatively primitive conditions. Many women, actually during vacation, they'd just rather fly off to Spain and sit in a taverna, let the kids go play on the beach and let somebody else do the cooking. Well, this all sounds rather unpleasant. Uh, but the point is an important one, that we have compensatory behaviors and we actually may have patterns of compensatory behavior, a solution that may be available. Well, it's getting pretty tight here in Stockholm. Why don't we get a leisure home? That may work for some people, but in fact, maybe a rather bad solution for other people. Now, of course, th this is a study that's looking at an effect or an association spread across people. I'm not meaning to say that this applies to all men and women. So we have a lose-lose situation, potentially. We want to avoid it. We can appreciate that people will compensate when presented with a situation in which in environmental demands are increased by densification at the same time as opportunities for restoration are diminished. To avoid putting people into a situation where compensation is perceived to be necessary, we can instead try
try to conceive of ways to arrive at, if we want to use a popular way of describing more satisfactory situations, a win-win situation. That there's a decrease in environmental demands with densification at the same time that there's an increase in opportunities for restoration. A decrease in environmental demands, for example, by helping people more easily travel to services, to workplaces and whatnot. And at the same time, an increase in opportunities for restoration as people experience the surroundings as surroundings that support restoration. Experience them perhaps as relatively green, places that they can go out to. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation in this regard. And some of it is sort of time-tested. Small scale, things that lots of people may, may do. Window boxes, a little bit of green outside the window to soften an otherwise very strictly built urban environment. Other innovations like green roofs, we see them appearing in more and more places. And we can appreciate that these may serve valuable ecological functions. For example, the management of urban runoff, capturing rainwater and so forth. But they may also be aesthetically pleasing, valued by people who are sitting in urban offices, looking out windows, taking a little break from their demanding mental work. Perhaps these bits of green on outside rooftops can support brief experiences of restoration that help them more easily make it through the day. More dramatic innovations catch the eye and also perhaps serving ecological functions. More green, uh, not only on the horizontal surfaces, but on the vertical surfaces. As we build higher, we have more vertical surface and there may be less horizontal surface for people to access. Um, I was in Milan, October 2013, saw this building under construction, the vertical forest. Have any of you seen this, this one? Um, this is an interesting experiment. You know, densification is inviting a lot of architectural experimentation and some of that is going together with experimentation and how we bring the natural environment into the city. Here you have these very distinct balconies and the idea is that you'll have very large planters on the balconies and trees in them and these trees will grow larger and mature and this building over time will become more and more green in its appearance. A vertical forest they call it. I say the jury is out on this because we can ask what it's going to be like for the people in these apartments. High up, they're looking out at dead, naked branches on a tree with a lot of crows sitting on them, shitting on the balcony. <laughs> it's nature, but it's perhaps not the nature they want to see from their breakfast table. So there will be a lot of innovation and, and some successes and some failures. But we can appreciate the intent to try and achieve this win-win situation. So some closing comments. Urban densification can provide significant social and ecological benefits, but it can also make it difficult for people to meet everyday needs and in other ways engender conflict. The overall gains may become uncertain. Stress, restoration, and health deserve consideration as metrics for judging the success of planned and completed urban densification measures. So yes, let's think about ecological benefits of reduced energy use, reduced demand for agricultural land and so forth. But let's not forget what kind of conditions we are putting people into in these dense urban settings. And let's appreciate that people may compensate in ways that undermine the intended benefits, the intended ecological benefits. Finally, design for densifying cities can benefit from the use of tools for systematically collecting information from the public with regard to stress and restoration, such as virtual representations of 
planned environments. Um, I'm currently involved in a project with researchers at Reykjavik University. Uh, part of the work involves building a virtual neighborhood in Reykjavik that is going to be densified. And the idea is to help people living in Reykjavik appreciate what that could look like. And putting them in that virtual environment, see how they react, see how they experience that place to be in its densified condition. So we have means, in fact, to proceed systematically and methodologically and perhaps not make terrible mistakes. Just maybe smaller ones. We'll see. Maybe some successes. Thank you all.